Auto Racing 82 on ESPN. The inaugural North Star Nationals from Brainerd International Raceway in Brainerd, Minnesota. The ninth stop on the NHRA Winston World Championship Series of Drag Racing. Brought to you by Budweiser. Remember, for all you do, this Bud's for you. A weekend of record-shattering performances here at Brainerd International Raceway. Not only on the racetrack, but in the thousands of campers that have jammed the area. The largest crowd in the history of this 468-acre facility. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave McClellan, and we hope you will enjoy what you're going to see. That is championship drag racing at its finest. The finest cars from throughout the United States, as far north as Canada, have jammed into Brainerd International Raceway for this inaugural North Star Nationals. A tremendous day of drag racing excitement coming your way. And working with me today, down on the starting line where everything begins, is sportscaster Marty Reed. Well, thank you, Dave. This is right. This is where it all begins. The 250-inch dragsters and top fuel will take off from this point with 2,500 horses kicking them in the butt and going all the way down to the other end, 1,320 feet away. Back to you, Dave. One quarter of a mile. That's the distance in championship drag racing. And at that finish line is a man that sat behind the wheel of one of those 2,500 horsepower top fuel dragsters, a former top fuel champion in his own right, Carl Olson. Thank you, Dave. We're in the vicinity of the racetrack known as the shutoff area. And down here, we'll be looking for these cars to slow from speeds in excess of 250 miles an hour. We'll be looking for our engine problems, interviewing some drivers, and trying to catch the pulse of the race on this end of the course. Back to you, Dave. Thank you, Carl. Shirley Muldowney is currently leading the top fuel points chase. Marty Reed had a chance to talk with her. For the fifth time this year in national event action, this lady, Shirley Muldowney, is going to meet former crew chief, Connie Kalita. It seems like every time I turn around, you two are running each other, and he says he's out to get you. Well, that's all he can say. He's... We all have confidence when we go in. Everybody thinks, you know, you get by the first round, you have it won, but our car's the car to beat, and he knows it. Right now, you're leading the points chase. It looks as though you're uh, really performing well, a 565 with a nine here. Uh, what about the car? car is great. It speaks for itself. It's been in almost every final this year. It's uh, an Al Swindle car built up in Tacoma, Washington, and uh, uh, I hope a lot of racers don't go up and buy a Swindle car because it's a, we have our hands full. It's an awful good piece. All right. If you, oh, I shouldn't say if. I know you, you're going to get past Connie Kalita in your mind. That means you'd probably be ended up with Mark Oswald, and he's number two. And it looks as though with Lucille Lee not qualifying, this is going to be a two-person race. I think it might be Oswald and I in the final, but uh, that's right. We do meet him second round, so that's good. Uh, try to eliminate him right off the bat, and the less points he gets, the better I like it. And that gives you a chance to pad your lead in the Winston World Cup points. Well, we have a more or less a, a padded lead right now because the standings, the people are not aware that in the standings, it doesn't show that we are actually a race down on everyone. So we can take points at another race where they can't. So we have really a very healthy lead right now. So as always, Shirley Muldowney, very confident. Well, we kind of start out slow and we don't put the cart before the horse and we kind of creep up on it. And you don't have to be number one qualifier to win the race. That doesn't always make it happen for you. Just consistency. Thanks for talking to us. Good luck. Thank you. Top Fuel Eliminator at the inaugural North Star Nationals kicking off the action with these 2,500 horsepower engines sitting behind the drivers and the Winston World Champion. Getting the final touch to his engine by his crew chief is Jeb Allen pulling ahead. He'll be on the tower side, the lane nearest our cameras here on ESPN's coverage of the North Star National. Alongside of him will be the fastest dragster in the world today, and that is the Candies in Hughes' car from Houma, Louisiana, Young Mark Oswald, the driver, coasting to the stop, comes Jeb Allen after his initial burnout. The burnout is a procedure that you will watch with all the cars, from top fuel dragsters to the slower stock cars. There may be something wrong on the Candies and Hughes car. 
And now it's pulling forward now. They apparently were just waiting for a second to get the engine started. Let Jeb Allen make his burnout. Marty? You know, this is a tactic that the Candies and Hughes team has been using all week. They do a very low burnout. Don't heat up the motor as much as some of the other teams. Seems to be working very well because they are running 256 in qualifying. Out of Homa, Louisiana, comes the team of Candies and Hughes, one of the longtime owner mechanic combinations in this sport. Paul Candies going back into the early 60s along with Leonard Hughes. Leonard himself used to be a driver, not only of a top fuel dragster, but the funny cars. And now he is the crew chief, the wrench, the engine builder, and the man that a lot of people attribute the tremendous success of this car. For Jeb Allen, here's a real story. He has won 10 national event titles, 10 national event titles in his career that dates back to 1972 when he was 18 years old and won the Summer Nationals. Both cars have completed the burnout. They're approaching the starting line into the pre-staging lights. The electronic device in the center of the track is the Christmas tree. That's what starter Buster Couch utilizes to send these two missiles down this racetrack at over 250 miles an hour. They're ready and side by side. You see Mark Oswald out in front of Jeb Allen, and it is Mark Oswald. His elapsed time, 5.74, 5.74 seconds to cover that quarter mile. And for Mark Oswald, his speed, 256.41 miles an hour, and that is a new national record. The fastest time in the history of the sport has officially been recorded here at the North Star Nationals as Mark Oswald runs 256.41 miles an hour. And Marty, he said he could do it. They were not real happy with the performance of the car in qualifying yesterday, but boy, they came back today. They made a few changes. Wouldn't be specific, of course, but uh, Paul Candy said they thought they came back with the right combination. And sure enough, 574 right out of the box and 256 miles per hour. As they say in drag racing, that is stout. Our next pair are started and approaching the burnout area. And when we talk about a burnout, you can watch it kind of closely here as Jack Ostrander from Pontiac, Michigan, comes up to roll through the water, gets the tires wet, and now he stands on it. That, folks, is what you call burning rubber. And Ostrander really is uh, the dark horse of the field. He really wasn't expected to qualify, but he came out the first round of uh, qualifying session ran a, a 577, made it into the show, but he never has matched it since, and he's a little bit worried. This car is driven by Joe Amato. He comes from Old Forge, Pennsylvania, and Joe is a former pro comp racer. He used to drive an alcohol dragster, but decided he's, they're very similar, and we'll be watching them a little bit later on. But the top fuel dragster is the ultimate accelerating machine in the world. There's nothing to compare with it in any form of motorsport. And Joe Amato says, why not put the nitro in and let's go racing? He's already been over 250 miles an hour. He qualified very well at this event. And his lovely wife backing him up into the tracks that he left as he came out of the burnout area. You know, an interesting point about Joe is he's tied for eighth currently in the point standings with Jim Bernard. Bernard failed to qualify for this event. So with this round, he could move into sole possession. Jack Ostrander has been recording some very good elapsed times lately. He is basically a Midwestern racer, does not travel the national event circuit that much. And Ostrander, a week ago at the popular Hot Rodding Championships, was running 570s. And everybody at that point said his day may come very soon. And it did here. This was one of the toughest fields to qualify at this event, as the number eight qualifier was Jeb Allen. And he took 5.81 seconds to cover the quarter mile in qualifying. And that was just number eight. The low qualifier is Gary Beck at a 565 right now. Jack Ostrander with the rear view mirrors. And you say, well, what's he going to be looking for? What he's looking for, he's looking back at the engine to see if there's something going wrong. And possibly he can catch it before it destroys itself and save himself several thousands of dollars. On the far side of the track, Joe Amato, Jack Ostrander. And Amato with a big lead off the starting line. And Amato has got a good one going at the finish, 5.80. His elapsed time at 245 miles an hour. 
Jack Ostrander was concerned going into the first round and justifiably so. 6.27 seconds, his speed 222, just did not have the horsepower. So Joe Amato takes the win, you see it there, 5.80 seconds, and that's how long it takes to cover a quarter of a mile from a standing start. The starting line, which is active, is controlled by the Christmas tree, which allows the racers to leave side by side, to leave equally together if they are right on time. And we can get into reaction times and things like that as we go on, but the Christmas tree is actually an electronic device. They have a one yellow light and then a green, four tenths of a second. As we have the starting line crew waiting alongside the next racers as our pair of cars that just ran, Jack Ostrander and Joe Amato being pulled off the track. The track conditions exceptionally good here as we have had record shattering performances in all three categories with the top fuel qualifying headed by that 5.65 second elapsed time by Gary Beck to put him in the number one spot. Here is Connie Conrad Kalita from Ypsilanti, Michigan. Connie Kalita is a longtime drag racer. He won the 1965 or 67 rather Winter Nationals. Dates back his national event career back to 1965 when he was the Spring Nationals runner-up. Thus far this season, he has won the Grand Nationals up in Montreal, Canada. Over so, guess who? I uh, guess who? Right Shirley on. Muldowney. Guess who's he's running this round? <laughs> Shirley Muldowney from Mount Clemens, Michigan. A lot of stories going around about this uh, Connie and Shirley situation. Connie was the crew chief for Shirley when she won her first ever Winston World Champion title which uh, was an awesome feat. Uh, the female in auto racing has generally been relegated to not a premier status until Shirley Muldowney came along. And she is the only person to have won a Winston World Championship title twice in Top Fuel Eliminator. She is currently leading the points chase. And as we heard her earlier, is very confident in her ability to go ahead and take a record uh, three Winston World Championship title. Well, so far this year, she's got 4,936 points. She won the Spring Nationals over Lucille Lee. She won the Gator Nationals over Big Daddy Don Garlitz, runner-up at the Winter Nationals, runner-up at the Cajun Nationals, and of course, we told you, runner-up at the Grand Nationals. And she leads Oswald, Mark Oswald, by only 160 points as they come into this event. So the lady driver, Shirley Muldowney against her former crew chief as she has raced many times before. And Marty, you talked with her before we got ready for this first round and she is very confident. I've never heard her express in so eloquent a terms her feeling of confidence going into this race. Well, she put it very bluntly, Dave. She said, they've got to catch me. I'm in front, my car is running well, everybody's got to find Shirley Muldowney and catch me. Well, the task now remains at hand to Connie Kalita. Kalita owns a flying service, has several uh, small jets, flies uh, both charters and uh, baggage charters, or uh, charter service that flies various and sundry components for some of the motor companies out of the Detroit area. And he got out of racing for a while, quit driving, uh, decided that it was uh, not really what he wanted to do and devoted his full time to his business but then came back as the crew chief for Shirley and then got back in the car and has been very successful since that time. In 1981, he won the Gator Nationals and the Southern Nationals, or I'm sorry, that was Shirley, but in 1980, he was runner up at the Winter Nationals to Shirley Muldowney. Connie Kalita, also was the Grand Nationals runner up, so he's been there before and he understands the pressure that can be building on a driver at this point. They, they've raced four times this year and they've split them. One a pair each. All right, the rubber match, if you might want to call it that, between Johnny Kalita and Shirley Muldowney. Both drivers are putting all their concentration on the Christmas tree. And a red light start. Connie Kalita gives it up on the starting line. A red light left at the starting line by Connie Kalita gives the win automatically to Shirley Muldowney. 5.88 seconds. Shirley goes 236 miles an hour. A 590 at only 203 as Connie Kalita knew he had left the red light on the starting line. And that is an automatic disqualification. What the red light means is you left 
just a bit too soon. And just as we speculated, it's now going to be in the semifinals, Mole Downey against Mark Oswald. And Oswald's going to have lane choice because he ran a better time. In instant replay, we can look back and see. Now watch the wheels in the near. There they move just perceptibly ahead of Shirley Mole Downey, and that's all it took. Just literally hundreds, of maybe even thousands of a second too quick. Connie Kalita lost it right at the starting line as Shirley Muldowney advances into the semifinal, picks up some very valuable points. And of course, she's now running the car and driver that is right behind her in that Winston points chase. Shirley Muldowney against Mark Oswald in the semifinals. We'll be back with more action in Top Fuel Eliminator here at the inaugural North Star Nationals at Brainer International Raceway in just a moment. Back at Brainerd International Raceway for the inaugural Quaker State North Star Nationals, we have one pair remaining in the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator. And I'll tell you, we're saving the best for last. The number one qualifier is Gary Beck, and he'll be racing this man out of Bakersfield, California, Doug Kerhulis. Kerhulis moved into the national event trail this season, has done an outstanding job in qualifying because this is one of the more difficult fields to make the program. Kerhulis qualified number five in an outstanding 5.75 seconds elapsed time, but that's an entire tenth of a second slower than Gary Beck. And a tenth of a second from uh, the vantage point at the finish line, you would find, is a tremendous distance in space as far as the, the separation between the cars as they go, go across the finish line. Kerhulis on his burnout, first out of the water. And Gary Beck, I don't think having any problems, he's getting ready to move up into the water area as our vantage point high atop this racetrack allows us a view that we can see from starting line to finish line as Gary Beck with the number one qualifier comes bouncing to a stop. Those big rubber tires, they're 18 inches wide, acting like a rubber ball almost. And these chassis are so flexible that you'd, you'd think they might snap, but they need that flexibility to handle all the stress of, that the motor of 2,500 horses puts on it. You know, Gary Beck is coming off a win at the popular hot rodding championships where he matched his 565 performance and ran 249 miles an hour. Gary has, of course, the low ET ever set in championship drag racing back uh, last season at the Winston World Finals out in Orange County of a five seven, uh, 557. And since that time, everybody has been looking for him to equal it. But it's very difficult on those picture-perfect runs to come up with him with any consistency. Doug Kerhulis is hoping that he will have a picture-perfect run because he's going to need it against Gary Beck. He finished number two in the world last season. Less than 30 points separated him from Jeb Allen. And he came within two and a half miles an hour, believe it or not, of winning the Winston World Championship title. And Kerhulis is going to try and dump the number one qualifier. And you know, Beck has been having all kinds of problems this year. He's qualified well, but many races, until last week, he wasn't getting past first round. In fact, he's 10th in the standings right now in the Winston World Cup Championship points. Beck won the U.S. Nationals title, one of the most prestigious ever, two times in a row, back in 1972 and 1973. And in 74, he won the Winston World Champion title. So he knows what pressure's about, and he knows what the winner's circle looks like. And he wants in there again, and he smokes the tires, going up in smoke. Watch closely. He backpedals and pulls it out at the finish line. It is Gary Beck winning it. A tremendous charge of 5.76 seconds at 241 miles an hour. You saw Beck lose traction at the starting line. He recovered and still drove around Doug Kerhulis, who ran 243 miles an hour, but just did not have the elapsed time. A 586 or a 585 rather for Kerhulis, not sufficient. As we look at it again, you can see just off the starting line, Beck up in smoke. He recovers quickly. The car locks itself back to the ground and watch him just pull away from Doug Kerhulis. Kerhulis trying his best at 243 miles an hour and thereby a car length is Gary Beck the winner. And again, about a tenth of a second and you can see that it's over a car length at the finish line and Beck did a tremendous job. You know, these cars only have two speeds, fast and faster. And the thing is that a lot of times what will happen is they'll see or feel the car shaking and getting in loose and they'll just pop it early, go into high gear, and that's exactly what happened. 
So that completes the first round of Top Fuel Eliminator. What we can look for in the next round is the matchups between Gary Beck and Joe Amato. But of course, the number one and two points leaders in the Winston World Championship Series, Shirley Muldowney against Mark Oswald. Dave, it's an awesome sight when they close that fiberglass shell down over the driver and there's 2,500 horsepower sitting in his lap, literally waiting to go screaming almost 250 miles an hour down the quarter mile. Dave? About ready for the start of eliminations. Right now, though, let's meet up with Marty Reed, who had a chance to talk with the number one leader in points in Funny Car, Frank Hawley. One of the stories here at the North Star Nationals is the fact that Don Prudhomme is not here at the North Star Nationals. He got himself into a contractual agreement situation with a track out on the West Coast, and he had to go there or else he would have been sued. He loses points, but it's a big break for you, Frank Hawley. You're currently leading the Winston World Cup by just 86 points. Yeah, it's a real close battle. There's four cars, us, Billy Myers, Don Perdome, and Raymond Beadle. And we're on top because, uh, you know, the race we won last weekend. And uh, th this is going to be a real deciding factor uh, for, you know, whether we're even going to go to the West Coast. You're not one of the high-dollar operations. Did you believe at the beginning of the year that you'd be at the top of the heap with only three events to go? It's surprising. I think we're getting a lot of help from above or something because it's been a tough road to, to travel and we have to run a lot of smaller races to help fund, you know, racing at the larger events. And uh, the car run come out of the box in the first of the year run really fast. So, you know, we didn't have any reason to doubt it. As it looks right now with the uh, hat and the shirt, it looks like you found a few sponsors because of your performance. Yeah, it helps out a lot and, and there's companies that are willing to, you know, advertise on the car and they get a lot of publicity like you find people out here today. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marty, and we're set to go with the first round of Funny Car Eliminator and these 2,500 horsepower rockets with their fiberglass bodies getting the final touches by their respective crews. In the near lane will be Kenny Bernstein, the Budweiser King, driving his car out of Dallas, Texas. The crew making the final adjustments necessary. Bernstein encased in the roll cage, patiently waiting, as all race drivers do. It's kind of like the Army, I guess. You hurry up and wait, as Al Segrini is doing the same thing as he watches his crew make the final adjustments to his car. And it's the hardest part of, for a driver because all he is, he's sitting in there and he's waiting. He's strapped in. There is not a single thing he can do. He's at the mercy of that little starter motor and if it turns over. The bodies, as you see, are raised to allow the access to the engines. They actually, the bodies are completely dismountable. Another pin in the back holds them down in the back. The crew, when they work on them between rounds, can lift them off. The signal just went out to start them up. They squirt a little gasoline into the injectors. They spin over the electric starter that is attached to the supercharger. It, in turn, turns the crankshaft, and all of a sudden, 2,500 horsepower plus spring to life in the funny car of Kenny Bernstein. And you know, it really took a he-man performance to just qualify for this field. The fastest eight-car show in NHRA history, Al Segrini at a 591 was the low qualifier, and Tom Anderson, the number eight qualifier, ran a 611. So Hugh had to be very quick to make this field. One of the most popular types of drag racing cars in the history of the sport has become these nitro-burning funny cars. As the two cars come out of the water and do their burnouts, I'll guarantee you there is not an eye in this massive facility that is not directed towards the quarter-mile racing service. With Kenny Bernstein, the Budweiser King, up against the Super Brute Special of Al Segrini, Texas versus Massachusetts. It used to be that the West Coast, California, was the hotbed of drag racing. But I tell you, anywhere you go today, the parts are available, the pieces, and the talent are, is available to make these cars perform regardless of where you live. This is an extremely important race for both drivers. Kenny Bernstein trails Frank Hawley in the points by 1,500. He knows that he has to win two of the final four national events to have a shot at the national championship. Bernstein finished number three in the world last season. He's sort of knocked on that door for several times. He's an interesting story. Kenny uh, had a little checkered drag racing career starting back in the early 60s. He drove a number of different funny cars, uh, dragsters, drove a lot of things. Then he decided to go into business and opened a chain of restaurants, was very successful, decided to come back to drag racing, and what did he 
debut, but the Chelsea King and then the Budweiser King cars, and has been ultimately successful. He is a professional racer, as is the Fabergé Superbrood car of Al Segrini. The staging procedure is now underway, centering their wheels on the starting line of 1,320 feet of high-traction asphalt. And a bit of a lead for Al Segrini, and a lot of lead for Al Segrini. A huge fire for Kenny Bernstein. And there goes the supercharger bouncing off the car as Kenny Bernstein exploded it in the lights. As our cameras follow him to a stop, both parachutes out. Bernstein exploding the engine. It's a 597 win for Al Segrini. The NHRA safety safari crew headed to the scene, and Bernstein sitting patiently in the car. Not an oil fire per se. It looked just like a supercharger explosion. And Bernstein, I am certain, is very upset with himself. As the fire crew in their protective clothing come and attempt to raise the body. You can see right on the scene, they carry all sorts of fire extinguishing compounds. Primarily, the first thing that hits it is water, just to cool everything down. The drivers are utilizing all sorts of fire safety equipment and, of course, onboard fire extinguishing systems. But Kenny Bernstein coming out of the car, walking away from it. As you can see, Kenny Bernstein taking off his gloves, not real happy with things at the moment. And the overflow crowd here giving a round of applause to Bernstein, but that's not the way anybody wants to go out of competition. As we get a chance to look at it again, follow it closely, and you can see the heat waves coming up off the car, indicating, of course, tremendous amounts of horsepower out of these engines. Segrini, at this point, has about a three-car length lead. Bernstein is trying to catch him. Things starting to go wrong with Bernstein at about this point. The motor starting to oil ever so slightly as things starting to come out of it. And there it explodes into a ball of fire. And that's the supercharger explosion. You see the supercharger coming up out of the flames right in front of the windshield. Now bear in mind, there's a driver sitting inside that car. He's trying to look through the flames, trying to figure out what do I do next? All he is concerned with at this point is keeping that car straight, making sure that it does not get into the opponent's lane and does not go off the racetrack. After that bit of excitement, what more can we ask for? Who knows as we continue in the first round of Funny Car Eliminator here at the inaugural North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway in Brainerd, Minnesota. We'll be right back. The North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway. We've just seen the excitement of a supercharger explosion in Funny Car Eliminator as the Budweiser King of Kenny Bernstein out of competition in the first round. Carl Olson has had a chance to catch up with him down by the finish line, and Carl is with Kenny at this moment. Thanks, Dave. Kenny, from our vantage point, it looked like you were about three quarters of the way down the track, and suddenly there was just a violent explosion. Do you have any idea what happened? Well, not exactly what caused the explosion at this time, Carl, but obviously the supercharger, which is on top of the engine that forces the air and the fuel into the motor, just exploded, and it came off the car, and then a, a little bit of a fire, a flash fire for a second or two. Uh, the cause, obviously, in most cases, is an intake valve hung open for a period of time and set a charge off in the intake manifold and makes it like a bomb. Yeah, it certainly looked like a bomb from here. And, uh, of course, we did notice that you got the parachute right out and uh, got on the brakes real hard, got the car stopped without any problems. Do you have any difficulty there at all? Well, no, at one point you can't see when the fire is on you and the oil is in your face. And But your instincts, and as much as we drive these cars, as we know to automatically go for the parachute immediately, then I went from there to the brake, which has the safety device of a fire extinguisher built into the brake that I can activate myself, which I activated, and it put the fire out immediately. And, and then it's just a matter of stopping then. It's just almost routine. Well, Kenny, you've been running exceptionally well in the last few weeks, and I, I know you're very disappointed going out in the first round, especially this way. Good luck in the future. And there's no problem. We'll be back. The Budweiser King will be there. Thank you, Kenny. Back to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Carl. And we caught right up with it as Kenny Bernstein completed uh, his description of what went on. You hear the sound of the nitro-burning engines of our next pair of cars ready to go. The body coming down on the car in the near lane is the reigning Winston World Champion for the past three consecutive years, and that is Raymond Beadle. From Dallas, Texas, this is the famed Blue Max. Beadle qualifying in in the number seven spot at 6.03 seconds, and he has had tremendous problems thus far at this event. 
sight of him from Stanton, California. He calls himself the Orange Baron. This is Gary Bergen. Bergen has won several national events and been a runner-up with a couple. He was a U.S. Nationals champion. Back in 1976, he was runner-up in 1981 at two events, the Golden Gate Nationals and the Winston World Finals, and a couple of other events stacked in between. Marty Reed, you were back in the pits a little bit earlier today, and we're talking uh, to Raymond Beadle, and he's not been happy at all. No, they've uh, made a, several changes on the motor. They wanted to try and get some more power. They're not getting any top-end speed, usually. Beetle is thundering in the 240s, high 240 range. He's been having trouble getting it 240 even. So they made a few changes in the motor, and we're going to see if it works. The 40 XP body on the Blue Max allows it to cut through the air at speeds upwards of 250 miles an hour. And sitting encased inside that car, it's almost a claustrophobic feeling for these drivers. But after you do it long enough, they become very, very accustomed to it. Uh, in other forms of motorsports, the drivers have come around and sat in the funny cars and they lowered the body down on them and they've got those breather masks on them and these drivers of champ cars, of sprint cars, they say, I wouldn't sit behind that motor for anything in the world. But Gary Bergen, for Raymond Beadle, it's just like uh, putting on your shoes every morning. Well, all you can see is the motor. And a little bit of plexiglass you look through with a great start and a lot of smoke out of Gary Bergen, but boy, is Bergen pulling an upset here. Putting down to defeat the Blue Max, Gary Bergen notches a 597 at 246.57 miles an hour. And Gary Bergen takes the measure of a Raymond Beetle 6.05. And you saw how far behind Raymond Beetle was. As Bergen coasts to a stop at the end of the track, here in tire-smoking splendor is the Orange Baron of Gary Bergen. This is the first time in three races against Beetle, a national event competition, that he's got the better edge. And he's got a big edge here. Look how many car lengths separate him. Gary Bergen at 597, 236 miles an hour, defeats Raymond Beetle and a motor starting to go away in Beetle's car as he approaches the finish line. The engine's coming to life in our next pair. This is Little John, Little John Lombardo. Not a household name in championship drag racing outside of Southern California, but the folks back in LA have learned to fear Little John Lombardo and to respect him because he is one of the premier racers of Southern California. The competition is the man that has been dominant throughout 1982. And this is Frank Hawley at the wheel of the famed Chi-Town Hustler. He won the Gator Nationals beating Tim Gross, the Spring Nationals beating Al Segrini, and then came back just the past week and won the popular hot rodding championships. So he has been running pretty consistently all year long. He was also runner-up at the Southern Nationals to Raymond Beetle. And believe it or not, you know, he holds the distinction of losing the quickest side-by-side -side funny car race to Raymond Beetle. That was back at the 82 Winter Nationals, and it was on a hole shot. He actually ran a quick relapse time, but he lost the race because he was late off the starting line, a 597 to a 596. And he really doesn't like to talk about that too much. Not too much. Violent burnouts by both drivers, indicating tremendous traction available. Those huge 18-inch wide slicks just clawing at the pavement that has now become a practically a rubber surface. So it is rubber to rubber as Little John Lombardo and Frank Hawley complete their burnouts. Hawley, a former pro comp racer. He used to drive alcohol funny cars. He drove alcohol alters. He drove practically everything. This season, he moved into the Chi-Town Hustler, and it has been a success for him. Moving into those light beams that indicate the starting line. Little John Lombardo and Frank Hawley. We're in round number one of the North Star Nationals Funny Car Eliminator. A great start and tremendous horsepower for Little John Lombardo. He smokes the tires. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, you've just seen low elapsed time of the meet for funny cars. And what a shot. 5.89 seconds for Frank Hawley at 243 miles an hour, a losing tire smoking 616 for little John Lombardo as he goes out of competition. We watch again in replay slow motion. You see right there, the clutch comes in, the horsepower comes in, and John Lombardo goes out. Yeah, smoking the tires just won't do it in this race because that right lane seems to be hooking up very well, and Frank Hawley powers on past and look at the distance as he runs a 589 the quickest funny car so far this week 
Tom Anderson in Jim Wimette's car. You see the eyes, and it gives you an indication of the concentration. He's thinking about what can I do to get my car down that racetrack just a little bit quicker than anybody else. He'll be in that left-hand lane. He just saw little John Lombardo go up in smoke. Jim Wimette's entry out of Macedon, New York. The body coming down on the car. Tom Anderson, a journeyman race driver, one of true professional skill, has driven a number of cars throughout his long and checkered career. The Chief Auto Parts 7-Eleven special of Billy Meyer. Now, Billy, so far, this is an interesting story. Billy Meyer has high speed at the meet so far at 250 miles an hour, but he hasn't really been able to match it after making that on the first qualifying pass. And he told me during the pits this morning, that uh, his mind just isn't in this race. His wife, Debbie, is pregnant. She's due any time this week, and he's having a hard time getting mentally prepared for this race, and mental preparation is at least 50%, and some drivers think as much as 80%. Yes, sir. The need for the concentration is very great in this sport because you have to really, really devote your entire mental processes to getting your car and yourself prepared for the run. For Billy Meyer, he has been over 250 miles an hour, probably more times than any funny car racer, well over 254. And with that 7-Eleven Chief Auto Parts special, I'm sure his wife Debbie back home in Waco, Texas, is wishing him the very best. Well, this is an important round for him because Frank Hawley leads him by 86 points and he's already into the semifinals, so Meyer has to win to keep pace. In fact, the winner of this race meets Frank Hawley. For Tom Anderson, Jim Wimette, the latest in a series of top quality rides. For a race driver, both of these men are 27 years old. Billy Meyer started his career in a funny car back at the age of 16, has never driven anything but a nitro-burning funny car. Disregard who you saw across the finish line first. It just doesn't matter because the win was decided at the starting line with a big red light for Tom Anderson and a tough break for the Anderson Wimet crew. An outstanding 6.08 seconds going to no avail at 240 miles an hour. As we watch again, you can see Tom Anderson leave way ahead of Billy Meyer. There's the red light. It's lost right there. They could have shut everything off, coasted through the quarter mile, and Billy Meyer would still have been the winner. Notice the time, though, 618 and only 216 miles an hour. During a, a break here, I'm going to have to go back and talk to Billy, see if he eased up at the top end to try and save the motor, or if he really had that much uh, or doesn't have that much motor. We'll be back at the North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway in just a moment. The North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway. The first round of funny car action is completed. And at the finish line, Carl Olson has with us the man that set low elapsed time for funny cars, Frank Hawley. Carl? Thank you, Dave. Frank, the Chi Town Hustler is known as one of the most consistent cars in the sport of drag racing, and a lot of your world championship points have been earned through consistency. Suddenly, here you are with low elapsed time of the meet up to this point at 5.89, and I've got to tell you, that was the cleanest car coming through the shutoff area of all of them. It looks like you might have found a real combination. Is that correct? Well, what happened was we heard our motor that we'd been running most of the summer uh, on Friday in qualifying and we had to change motors and we took a three-year-old motor out of the truck and put it in the car and it seems to be working very well. I mean at the first of the year we started running really quick at Pomona and we didn't win the race and you know we run okay at Gainesville. It fell off for most of the summer and it appears that we've got it back now. Well it's certainly a pleasure to have you on the world championship circuit this year and uh, we look forward to seeing a lot more of you as the race goes on. Well, thank you very much Carl and we're going to try our best to win it. Back to you Dave. Thank you, Carl. I guess museum pieces like us have a place somewhere in this sport of drag racing. <laughs> Taking a motor three years old out of the trailer and putting it in and running a 589. That is the low ET thus far. Frank Hawley driving the famed Chi Town Hustler. He is moving into the semifinals and every race he wins, he continues to mount up points in that Winston World Championship Series. Sitting patiently waiting, not only this tremendous throng of spectators that is jammed into Brainerd International Raceway, but our pro stock racers. And what a show we have for you here. There's campers scattered 
I'll tell you, Marty, you've been wandering around out there, and uh, it is just unbelievable. There are campers some six to 8,000 strong. You can see some of the tents and the trailers and the trucks that people have brought to this facility. You know, this is the only facility on the NHRA circuit that allows camping right on the, the racetrack area. So in other words, everybody, once you move in, you're here for the week and you don't have to leave. And it's really been convenient from what we hear. Everybody's been having a fantastic time. And look at them wait. That's right. They as know can, when they're on the tube. As you can see, uh, age matters not here at championship drag racing events. Everybody loves it because it is a spectacular show as the National Hot Rod Association presents the best show in town in, ra in drag racing and practically all forms of motorsports. It's just an exciting thing to see. Cars accelerating over a quarter of a mile, reaching speeds over 256 miles an hour. We've already seen a new national record set today by the Candies and Hughes team at over 256 miles an hour. We've seen funny cars at this event over the 250 mile an hour mark. And of course, uh, coming up next, we'll be getting into the Pro Stock Eliminator category. So while our uh, Pro Stockers get set to go, we'll tell you, you have got a tremendous amount of action coming your way on ESPN. And what you've got is on Saturday, October 2nd at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, live, Eddie Muhammad, Eddie Mustafa Muhammad against Lottie Moale for a 10-round light heavyweight championship in ESPN's new boxing series, continuing with a, this knockout of a fight. That's Saturday, October 2nd, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, live, right here on ESPN. And right now, we are set to go with Pro Stock Eliminator, and Pro Stock, of course, the fastest of the factory hot rods. Here is the Ford EXP of Bob Glidden with a 496 cubic inch engine. Doing his burnout off the starting line, the wheels in the air, and of course, these cars limited by rules to gasoline. Two carburetors only, 500 cubic inches maximum, 2,350 pounds of car weight. And after that, just Katie bar the door, do whatever you practically want to do. The engine's got to stay in stock location, basically, and so does the driver some very exotic equipment. And this first round matchup is going to have the number two man in the point standings, Frank Iaconio, against this man, number three, Bob Glidden. And by the numbers on their windshield, that in their windows rather, indicates how they finished last season in the Winston World Championship points chase. Number two last year was Bob Glidden. Number three was Frank Iaconio. You know, out of all the races that these guys have been at this year, nine on the NHRA circuit, this will only be the second time that these two have met which is kind of uh, rare. Iaconio foregoing, apparently, the burnout across the starting line. He is in the pre-stage light, waiting and watching at the wheel of his Chevrolet Camaro, 500 cubic inches and 81 Camaro. The 82 Ford EXP, the short wheelbase car, out of Ford Motorcraft, 496 cubic inch, shotgun heavy. This is Bob Glidden in the Ford, the number one qualifier. 787 at over 174 miles an hour on carburetors and gasoline. Watch him go. A great start for Iaconio. He's got the lead. Can he hold on to it at the finish line? And he does. Frank Iaconio wins it. 792 to a losing 792. His speed only 168 miles an hour, and it was the whole shot advantage off the starting line that gave it to Frank Iaconio over the number one qualifier, Bob Glidden. As we watch again in slow motion replay, you can see the advantage gained by Frank Iaconio off the starting line. Either due to tire spin or just the reaction time of the driver, he put a whole shot on Bob Glidden that paid off at the finish line as Glidden tried hard and charged hard to catch him but was unable to do so. Going into a little bit of the grease sweep on the cleanup from the last car down by a half a car length, Frank Iaconio defeats the number one qualifier, 7.92 seconds his elapsed time. Our next pair, the man currently leading the points chase in the far lane of the racetrack, that is the rare and Morrison Camaro with Lee Shepard, and he mathematically has won the 1982 Winston World Championship title, and with it, the $20,000 season in bonus money going to Lee Shepard from Arlington, Texas at the wheel of this car for the second year in a row, the Winston World Champion. Give me an idea just how 
strong he has been all season long. He won the Gator Nationals, the Southern Nationals, the Cajun Nationals, the Grand Nationals, the Mile High Nationals. Then, at the Winter Nationals, Spring Nationals, and some Nationals, he was runner-up. I mean, he has been in the final. That's what you call dominance. Alongside of him trying to pull the upset is Don Coons from Cayuga, Indiana, driving the Coons and Clark car, formerly Sportsman Eliminator Racers, moving up into the professional ranks with his outstanding Camaro, tremendous RPM. The advantage to Shepard as they come by our ESPN broadcast booth. And by two car lengths, Shepard at the finish of 7.93 to a losing 8.10. Shepard's 175 mile an hour charge at the finish. Puts him well ahead of Don Kuntz, so he advances into round number two. Shepard was the number two qualifier. In the lane nearest the tower, or nearest our camera positions, you see John Lingenfelder from Decatur, Illinois. John, a former sportsman eliminator racer in competition, moving up into pro stock is racing Warren Johnson from Norcross, Georgia. Johnson, formerly out of Fridley, Minnesota, now moved down into the Norcross, Georgia area. W.J. Warren Johnson and a red light for John Lingenfelder. He just couldn't wait. He knew he had to take a shot at him, and it didn't pay off because he got the big red eye, and Warren Johnson drove around him anyway at the finish. Didn't matter. W.J. takes the win. 793, 173 miles an hour. In the semifinals, he'll be matched against Frank Iaconio for John Lingenfelder's debut. An outstanding job in just getting into this program. As we look again at the start of that last race, you see John Lingenfelder will roll ever so slightly and then a whole bunch ahead <laughs> of Warren Johnson. And that's what you call a red light. Oops. Oops, <laughs> yeah, you got it. As Warren Johnson takes an easy ride, but he doesn't back off of it. He still runs 173 miles an hour. The final pair in this round in the lane nearest our camera position is Brian Stewart while we look at Bob Ingalls back up from Carmel, New York. Ingalls, 41 years old, has really come into his own in the last few races this season. He is beginning to run some 780 elapsed times, which you have to do to be competitive in this sport. For Brian Stewart, he's 24 years old. He is a trucker by trade for the family who apparently uh, have a considerable cattle business. He's got an outstanding operation with a huge 18-wheeler rig and uh, this magnificent Camaro in pro stock racing for Bob Ingalls. He's an auto mechanic during the week, races on the weekend for Jay Rutherford, the, the car owner out of Katona, New York. Ingles qualified with a 792 at 174 miles an hour, and Brian Stewart just made the field at an 804 at 169 miles an hour. Yeah, we've got a chance. We had to talk a little bit about if you notice the right-hand lane seems to be the dominant lane so far. Yeah, but you got to also remember that the car with the low elapsed time has the lane choice, and if they feel whether there is or isn't any difference, uh, they will take the lane that they see the lower car in front of them taking. And a great lead, hey, Ryan Stewart, right alongside of Bob Ingalls, and for his national event. They Pulls out the upset of the race thus far. 8-12 at 167 miles an hour. And Brian Stewart wins his first round race over Bob Ingalls. And what an upset because Ingalls has been running exceptionally well. We notice there on the Quaker State scoreboards, though, that 154 miles an hour for Bob Ingalls is not enough to make the horsepower. As we watch again, maybe we can see Ingalls in the far lane slow perceptibly because... He appeared to have a bit of a lead at that point, and then here comes Brian Stewart charging hard at the first timing light and at the finish line. Oh, talk about a matter of inches. That's it, just by about eight to 10 inches, it appears, Brian Stewart got there ahead of Bob Ingalls. Let's move down to the finish line now, and once again, Carl Olson. Thank you, Dave. I'm here with Frank Iconio, who just defeated low qualifier Bob Glidden in a real driver's race. 7.92 elapsed times for both cars. What did you do to trick the car up to run that well this morning? Well, Carl, I don't know how the track is today. Uh, I ran 7.92 qualifying, and Bob ran 7.87. So uh, I don't know whether I picked mine up or he slowed his down. It looked like a heck of a race down here. The race must have been won on the starting line. Yeah, I had a 4-1. 
which is, I guess, you know, pretty perfect. I don't know what he had, you know? Uh, I didn't see the reaction time, but I can tell you it was an awful close show. Back to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Carl, and we're getting ready for the semi-final round of racing here at the North Star Nationals in Rostock Eliminator. You stick around. The inaugural North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway has been a host to the largest crowd in the history of this massive facility, which dates back to 1968. It's also been treated to record performances on the racetrack and to one of the most dreaded things any funny car driver can face, and that is an engine explosion and fire. We saw Kenny Bernstein go up into a ball of flames. Each of the drivers wears protective clothing, and Carl has the story. I'm with funny car driver Al Segrini, the number one qualifier here at the North Star Nationals. And Al, we'd like to talk a little bit about the spectacular nature of the funny car. It's certainly one of the fastest and more powerful classes in, in all of drag racing, and I suspect a little bit dangerous as well. Perhaps you could take the time to tell us a little bit about the safety equipment that you're going to use this weekend. Sure, that'd be fine. Okay. This is your basic fire suit that a funny car driver must wear. It consists of nine layers of Nomex fiery retardant material. Next, we have a fire mask, which is also of nine, nine layers also, which has, if you notice, respirators built in for the driver to breathe inside the cockpit, which fills up with fumes, and the fumes of nitromethane, etc. You notice it has eye holes in it, and the driver's eyes are protected by goggles, which cover your eye openings, which are also of a safety retired material the goggles are made of. Then comes your, your safety helmet, which is also SEMA approved, the safety specs you have to have to drive this type of car. I suspect the helmet is good both for fire protection and protection in the event of a crash. Correct, it also it protects your head, in other words, if you did have a crash from bouncing around, also any kind of concussion or weather, and also it protects you from any type of a flame or whatever. Then we have a, your basic glove, which, five-fingered glove, which is made of Nomex, which is very important to a driver because all the controls are operated by your hands inside of the cockpit. In case of any trouble, you have to move your hands around, which could get very hot in there. And how about the boots? Okay. A driver's boot, feet are protected by a similar type of a boot, which the glove is made in the same type of material, which protects the driver's boot, feet, in case of a fire or an accident or whatever. Let's take the opportunity now to look at the race car itself and see uh, some of the safety equipment that's involved there. The first thing I notice, Al, is a couple of large red cylinders here on either side of the fuel tank. What are those? All right, these are called your onboard fire system, which are filled up with 22 pounds of Freon, which will eliminate, in case of a fire, what it does, it eliminates the flames. It eats up the oxygen in the area of the fire, which will put the flames out. I notice you've got a number of various kinds of shields and safety devices on the engine, but I particularly notice a, a couple of tubes here. What are those for? Okay, this is your basic way the motor breathes. In case of any blow-by or a hurt piston or whatever, the blow-by will come through this tube, follow the frame into a catch can on the back, which will eliminate from pushing out any gaskets or whatever which could cause a fire. I see, and on further back, of course, is the business end of the race car, the driver's cockpit. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the controls and how you activate these various safety equipment items. Sure. A funny car consists of a handbrake, which is activated right here. Now, you asked earlier about the fire system up front. Well, in order to activate the fire system, there's a lever right here, which the driver would squeeze, and it would puncture the bottles, and it would fill the cockpit up with Freon, which would put the fire on in case of a fire. Then we move along here. We have a six-point roll cage, which the driver is protected with in case of an accident, in case of the car flipping or whatever, and you're harnessed in it with a six-way harness, which keeps the driver confined in this area. Al, it's all very impressive, and I've got to ask you the obvious question. With all of this driver's protective equipment on and all of this impressive, sophisticated safety equipment on the car, 
At 240 miles an hour plus, do you really feel safe in this vehicle? Well, I feel very safe. The car was built for that. I mean, in case of an accident, I've seen a couple of accidents that were pretty bad, and the driver walked away with no more than a headache. So, I mean, the car's really built safe. As long as you stay in the confinement of this roll cage area, in case of a flip or anything, you, you know, nine out of ten times, you're not going to get hurt. You may get bruised up a little. Good luck this weekend, Al, and uh, we certainly hope your performances hold up to your qualifying times. Thank you very much, Kyle. Thank you, Carl. That safety equipment worked to perfection in the explosion with Kenny Bernstein, and hopefully it won't be needed again here at the North Star Nationals. This is the semifinal round of Pro Stock Eliminator, the semifinal round where only four cars remain. It is the car of Lee Shepard in the near lane. That is the red and white car that has already locked up the Winston World Championship title. For the second season in a row, this big Camaro of Rare and Morrison with Lee Shepard, the driver, will wear the number one, signifying the Winston World Champion title. Alongside of him, the upset winner out of South St. Paul, Minnesota, practically a hometown racer, just getting started in pro stock racing, is Brian Stewart. Lee Shepard has annexed the quickest elapsed time thus far of round number one of racing. Correction, he is the second best at a 7.93, but he has a big performance margin over Brian Stewart. Shepard went 7.93 in round number one, Stewart an 8.12. And you say, well, that's not very quick when you compare him to the top fuel dragsters and the funny cars, but it is quick when you consider these started out as real cars. They are now legitimate, highly sophisticated pieces of racing equipment, costing somewhere in the neighborhoods of thirty to fifty thousand dollars each. And just the pressure of Brian Stewart trying to race Lee Shepard. Well, you saw that pressure just then as Brian Stewart left a big red light at the starting line, and it doesn't matter that he got there first as the parachutes come out for both cars. 816 for Brian Stewart, but the red light at the starting line cost him the race. I'll tell you, his old right or left leg on the clutch got just a little bit too nervous and he lost it to Lee Shepard. So Lee Shepard taking home the win and moving into the finals of this first ever North Star Nationals. Watching again, Brian Stewart. Oh, he left way ahead of him. As you can see, the car is practically past the starting line completely before Lee Shepard even moves. So there was no doubt in anybody's mind what was the thought of Brian Stewart. Well, he had to go for it. He just uh, went a little bit too soon. If you'll note, an interesting thing has occurred in this pro stock racing. The lower elapsed time choice, the lane choice, has now seen it switch to the left lane. That's true, that's As true. As you saw Lee Shepard just then have low ET, he took the left lane. Here Frank Iaconio in the left lane nearest the tower or our camera position here on ESPN from Totowa, New Jersey. Frank Iaconio finished third in the world last season. He is currently number two for Warren Johnson, a former Minnesota resident out of Fridley, Minnesota, now based in Norcross, Georgia. He gets the right-hand lane. He had the slower time. Iaconio had the choice. Lots of RPMs out of these 500 cubic inch engines. And the wheels in the air, but for Warren Johnson, the red light at the starting line. To no avail was his victory there at the finish as he left the red light glowing. And for Warren Johnson, he had to take a shot at it. A 7.98, the losing time for Johnson. 7.95, the winning time for Iaconio, and it was just a hairbreadth of a second, just about a heartbeat. That's what it takes to be a champion in NHRA-style championship drag racing, which is the North Star Nationals. The current performance king in top fuel belongs to this man, car owner Paul Candies of the Candies and Hughes Special. Paul, what are you guys doing? You own the world record, a mark that stood since October of 1975, and now here you've run 2.56. Well, we've run 2.50 at almost every racetrack we've raced at this year. Combination's really working good, new driver, new crew, and of course old Leonard is probably, Leonard Hughes is probably the king of making horsepower. Our sponsors have really worked well with us here. The Goodyear people have got us a great set of tires now, and we're seeing we're getting some of our power to the ground. We had a little problem so far this week. Even at the 256, we kind of smoked the tires a little. I think the car run that fast to 
maybe even run faster in a uh, you know really first rate racetracks we can probably run that fast we've run uh, 23 or 24 runs this year in excess of 250 miles an hour so uh, the secret of the thing is just make a run on all eight cylinders not burn a lot of stuff up and, and good crew what about some of the inside secrets though i mean i know you don't want to give away anything but uh, what are you doing different that that some of the other drivers aren't getting as far as mile an hour Oh, we, we just, I think the secret of our car running good is Leonard is so talented as a mechanic. He just, it runs on eight cylinders all the time and it doesn't burn itself all up before we get to the end of the racetrack. It's, uh, as we say, they run a lot better on fuel than they do on aluminum. And Mark Oswald's a hungry driver. Mark's a hungry young driver and we're glad to have him aboard. Well, listen, continued success. Good luck. Thank you very much. One of the great gentlemen in the sport of drag racing, Paul Candies out of Des Almonds, Louisiana. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of people here at Brainerd International Raceway that's having a great time. We hope you're enjoying all the action. We'll be coming right back with the ProComp semifinals. The string of luck for Chris Pettingell has finally run out here at the North Star Nationals. As his car lost fire after the burnout, he turned off early. So it'll be a single for this man, Vic Anderson, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, as Pettingell gets out of his car, very disappointed. But he made it to the semifinals, and that was a bit of a surprise. Anderson shutting it off to a 692, only 181 miles an hour. So it is in the final of Minneapolis, Minnesota based entry, Vic Anderson driving the Rodec powered top alcohol dragster, running on methanol rather than nitromethane. The cars look a lot alike the top fuel car, but they are somewhat slower due to the lack of horsepower directly attributable to the nitromethane fuel. You can look at uh, Pettengill there as the victorious Anderson crew goes down to pick up Vic as he turns in, as he shuts off early, a 692 and 181. But uh, getting back to Pettengill, he, you know, he got in because uh, John Samalik, the number one qualifier, was not able to make the program. And he comes in and gets advantage of a red light situation over Ken Murray. But you still got to feel a little sorry for him because it's always tough when you don't get a chance to at least make that trip down the quarter mile. You can talk to the racers and they will tell you they don't mind getting beat. They don't like it, but they don't mind it near as bad as something breaking right on the starting line and preventing them at least having a shot at a fair competitive situation between his fellow racer. And for Chris Pettingell, that's just what happened. Here's the final pair of cars in this semi-final round of top alcohol dragster at the North Star Nationals. In the near lane, it is Dennis Marcel smoking the tires out of the water. The purpose of that burnout is to get it just as hot and sticky as possible. Another Minneapolis-based car. It may be possible that we could have an all-Minneapolis-Minnesota final. But there is one driver standing in the way, and that is 20-year-old Darrell Gwynn. And he has been the dominant force in alcohol dragster competition for the last couple of years. This season, he has seen his advantage somewhat disappear as Don Woosley of Woosley Sharp and Reynolds has done an outstanding job. But for Daryl Gwynn, the 20-year-old professional racer, he was a high school student when he started driving these alcohol cars. His dad, Jerry Gwynn, the builder and tuner on them, and also a fine racer in his own right out of Miami, Florida. Well, Forsell knows he has a lot to make up. I talked to him back in the pits. He says, Gwynn's running two-tenths of a second quicker than I am. I've got to get him out the line so we can look for Forsell and beware of the red light situation again. Starter Buster Couch looking closely at the Forsell and Clark entry from Minneapolis, the bright blue car here approaching the starting line. For Darrell Gwynn, the sleek bullet on the spectator side of the lane furthest from our ESPN camera position. He's got the performance advantage, but can Dennis Forsell overcome that on the starting line? I'll tell you, you know it's your day when you not only have the performance advantage, but you do it off the starting line. Look at that. 6.64, the elapsed time for Daryl Gwynn at 203 miles an hour, the losing time 683 at 200 miles an hour and Daryl Gwynn moving first off the starting line. So it'll be Vic Anderson against Daryl Gwynn in the finals of top alcohol dragster. Well, Gwynn gets off a great start there and uh, Purcell gave it everything he could. Watch the start and you'll see that Daryl breaks just a hair faster than Dennis Purcell, but then 
You can see how Fursell gets a little bit out of shape right there, drifting towards the center line, and that's enough. That's it, and that is enough for Daryl Gwynn to take the victory over the Minneapolis base car of Dennis Fursell. We'll be back in just a moment with the semifinals of top alcohol funny cars here at the North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway. You stick around. Take it easy. Back at the North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway, I'm Dave McClelland along with Marty Reed. And working down in the finish line turnaround area is our compatriot, Carl Olson, and he has got Vic Anderson. Carl? Thanks, Dave. Yes, Vic Anderson is a local boy making good today. You've got to race the killer in this class. They're all going in the final. What are you going to do? Well, in this kind of racing, it's uh, a lot of skill and a lot of luck, and uh, I've got a heck of a good wrench here in Gary Schmidt, and uh, I think with a little luck, we'll do okay. Good luck. Thank you, Mike. Back to you, Dave. Thank you, Carl. And from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Vic Anderson in the final of this first ever North Star Nationals at Brainerd. And this overflow crowd is just chock full of folks from Minnesota. And they would love to see Vic Anderson take home the first ever title in Top Alcohol Dragster. Our concentration now, though, is on Top Alcohol Funny Car. And the two best funny cars at the moment are Vern Motes and Frank Manzo. This is Vern Motes. He recorded an elapsed time in the previous round of 6.70 seconds at over 207 miles an hour. That's great, you say it is, until you consider what Ace Manzo, the Winston World Champion, did. He went 6.61 at also over 207. This is one of those races, Marty, you could just call a toss-up. And Vern Motes needs it desperately because in the points chase, he's down in ninth place. And of course, Ace Manzo is leading the way with over 5,000 points. Frank Manzo wants to be the first ever repeat champion in Top Alcohol Funny Car. He needs a win here to increase his lead in that Winston Points Cup standing. A lot of psychological work going on the starting line. And look at Ace Manzo just thrill Vern Motes. What a hole shot. Manzo the last to stage and he was the first to get there. 665 at over 208 miles an hour. A valiant effort by Vern Motes at 6.80 at 207. The crowd rejoicing with Ace Manzo as the Winston World Champion notches another victory in his belt. Watch the whole shot put on by Manzo. He was the last to stage. You see Vern Motes is there. Now Manzo will come into the staging beams last and leave first. That's what it's all about right there. You saw him just jump right off to the start, the lead, and within a few hundred feet, he had a car length lead over Vern Motes. Our next pair of cars in this top alcohol funny car competition, the outstanding Gottschalk and Macalco entry. That is the bright yellow machine that you will be seeing. Alongside of him, the multicolored entry of Haywood and Near, Bruce Near and Don Haywood. Haywood, the driver, the body coming down on his car, checking to make sure the latch is held securely so the body will not come off the car. As you can see, it is a wedge shape almost, and it helps the funny car cut through the air. And you say, well, how can they run as quick and as fast as those little slender dragsters? Well, the aerodynamics on these cars are superior in some regards to those of the funny cars because those big wide slicks in the back are covered by the body. How did the first round go between these two? Well, Bob Gutshaw came in with a 673 at 205 miles an hour, Dave, and he gets lane choice in this situation, is going to take the right side. Don Haywood turned in a 680 flat at 204. So the situation again, though, in the point standings, very important because Bob Gutchalk is number two in the point standings behind Frank Manzo. Don Haywood is number four. So we have had some fantastic racing by top 10 competitors all the way around. In all the categories of competition, Marty, that has been the case. And I think the crowd that is jammed into Brainerd International Raceway has truly been treated to the best cars in the country here for this first ever North Star Nationals. For Bob Gottschalk, he needs this win because if he doesn't, that means automatically the Ace Manzo entry will move up a couple of hundred points just by virtue of this win in the semifinal round. It could come down to the final between Gottschalk 
and Manzo. That's what Bob would like to see as we had an interview with him earlier. He said that's the final he wants to see, of course, but he's got to get past Don Haywood, and that may not be any easy task. He's 356 points behind going into this round. He cannot afford to lose. Both cars very cautiously approaching the staging beams, trying to get set in their own minds exactly how they want to leave. They are sitting in the pre-stage light. Now they gently roll forward into the staging beams. Don Haywood is ready. Bob Gottschalk is ready. A great start. Gottschalk has the bit of a lead at the few hundred feet and a 6.70 for Bob Gottschalk with a speed of 205 miles an hour, moves them into the finals against the reigning world champion. That is Frank Ace Manzo in Top Alcohol Funny Car. Of course, those two cars will run. Then the winner of that race will run the winner of the Top Alcohol Dragster competition for the overall Pro Comp champion here at the North Star Nationals. At the starting line, both cars staged very cautiously, and it appeared to us in as they left, uh, just what we thought, they left together. No car had the advantage as far as reaction time, but Bob Gottschalk, through the superior horsepower or better traction, pulled a slight lead at a couple of hundred feet out and went on to extend it to take the victory over Don Haywood by approximately two car lengths as they cross that finish line. The timing devices, as you can see, are also controlled by light beams across the finish line. The light beams are actually 132 feet apart with the finish line exactly in the center. And that's that broad yellow stripe, but the light beam is the timing device. It is 1,320 feet away from the starting line, and a photo cell controls the action at the finish line as it does at the starting line. And everybody get ready because we're going into top fuel dragster competition. At Brainerd International Raceway, we're back with our continuing coverage here on ESPN of the North Star Nationals. I'm Dave McClelland, along with Marty Reed and Carl Olson, and we hope you're enjoying all the excitement of championship drag racing. There is a race within a race here, not only for the North Star Nationals title, but also continuing to mount points leading to the Winston World Championship crown at the end of the year. Currently, Shirley Muldowney is number one. Right behind her is Mark Oswald, driving the Candies and Hughes car. In third spot is Lucille Lee. Number four, the defending champion, Jeb Allen. And in the fifth spot is Gary Beck. In sixth, you see Jody Smart, then Dwight Salisbury, Jim Bernard, and Joe Amato tied for eighth, and Gary Beck bringing up the number 10 spot. You saw number three in the point standing at the moment is Lucille Lee, but she did not make this program here at the North Star Nationals, and that could be very, very costly to her in her world championship points chase. Marty has the story. One of the biggest surprises at this year's North Star Nationals is the fact that the number three leader in the point standings, Lucille Lee, did not qualify for the event. What happened? Well, I just think that uh, we came here with a whole lot of power. Uh, we tried something different, I think, on the first run. Uh, yesterday and hurt something real bad, hurt the engine real bad in the second run. Today we definitely had the power, but with the wheels coming up uh, with the last qualifying run, uh, put some more weight on it for this one. And I just think uh, maybe just got overpowered. I don't know. It's you a good track. You're 460 points behind going into this event, not qualifying now with only three races to go. You got to play a lot of catch up. Uh, well, actually, we had to drop one more race for the uh, Winston points, so this is the race that we have to wave our points on, and we got no points, so... Uh, so you still feel pretty good about it? Well, I don't like not qualifying. This is the first NHRA event that I've been to that I haven't qualified at, and uh, race day is always the best day, so I'm, I'm pretty disappointed about that. But as far as points go, we, did, we would still have to drop a race anyway and wave our points, so I guess this is a race to do it at. Okay, thanks for talking to us. Sure. Good luck at the next event. Thank you. This is Shirley Muldowney from Mount Clemens, Michigan. She was the first woman ever to be licensed to drive a top fuel dragster. She is the only person ever to win a Winston Top Fuel World Championship title twice. 
That feat had never been accomplished before until Shirley did it, and she is on her march for her third Top Fuel World title, and Marty, she is feeling very confident. Oh, excellent uh, attitude as far as her pit and her crew is concerned. One thing stands in her way here at the North Star Nationals, though, and that is the blue car of Candies in Hughes, the new national record holder at over 256 miles an hour. And Candies and Hughes, with Mark Oswald doing the driving, have been over 250 miles an hour consistently over the last 25 to 30 runs. For Shirley Muldowney, she also is consistent at speeds of 250 miles an hour plus. But bear in mind, speed means absolutely nothing. It is who gets to the finish line first. It's who gets to the finish line first makes all the difference. Mark Oswald, we should tell you, we went back in the pits, checked in at the uh, Candies and Hughes camp. They went to a bigger tire. They are trying to get more traction on the track this time. They feel like they've got to run a quicker time, and they ran a 574 last time out. In addition to the bigger tire, what they also went to is a 15-inch wide centerline wheel. It is a new wheel developed by centerline. It is 15 inches wide, and the tire itself reaching 18, 19 inches in width. They're trying to get more traction in the middle of the course. Good gracious alive, they're running 256. What will they do this time? Let's watch as Mark Oswald at the wheel of the Candies and Hughes car against the Winston points leader, Shirley Muldowney. And a great start by both drivers. Shirley Muldowney is out on Mark Oswald and she has pulled it off. Shirley Muldowney burning an engine at the finish line, wins the race 5.71 seconds at 249 miles an hour and she extends her lead, Shirley Muldowney, defeating Mark Oswald in this, the semifinal round of Top Fuel Eliminator. The losing time for Oswald, 5.79 seconds, 252 miles an hour. As we watch again on ESPN slow motion replay, you can see how it happened at the start as Shirley pulled a slight lead. The wheel's just dancing off the pavement. She is out on Mark Oswald, a bit of tire smoke, indicating a loss of traction, and that's all it took for Shirley Muldowney to get there first. Tremendous close racing here at the North Star Nationals, and that is indicative of the quality field that has shown up for this event. Well, again, Mark Oswald runs over 250 miles an hour, but this time, Shirley Muldowney gets to the line first, and number one against number two, and number one prevails. That's right. He just couldn't make it up at the finish line, and try as he might, at over 252 miles an hour. Our next pair, the final two cars in this round of top fuel racing. This is Joe Amato from Old Forge, Pennsylvania. Amato yet to win his first major event, moving up from the pro comp ranks where he was very successful. Alongside of him, the low qualifier, Gary Beck, driving for Larry Miner. Larry Miner, a potato farmer, owning hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland in five western states has been in all sorts of motorsports as an owner. He also has owned drag boats and all types of things. Gary Beck, his latest driver, the wife of Joe Amato, backing him into his own tracks. You know, I find that hard. I gotta tell you the truth. If I had Jerry backing me up, I'd have a hard time concentrating on the race. Eh, it's all a matter <laughs> of priorities, I yeah. think, Marty, at that moment. <laughs> And Jerry Amato, as she has for many a year, supporting her husband here in championship drag racing. Not only with her thoughts, but also with her deeds. The crew overworking on Gary Beck's car, possibly something going wrong. But now they seem to say, hey, okay, at this point, the bright chrome roll cage of Joe Amato sparkling in this Minnesota sunshine here at Brainerd International Raceway. Gary Beck coming into the staging beams. In the far side of the track, Joe Amato here on the tower side. This is the final pair of cars. The winner will go in to face Shirley Muldowney in the finals of the North Star Nationals. Which car will it be, Gary Beck or Joe Amato? Tire smoking Gary Beck is the winner by the red light from Joe Amato. Five, six.
78 for Gary Back, 244 miles an hour. Shirley Muldowney will have the lane choice in the final as Joe Amato wastes the 595, 248. He just couldn't wait. He knew he was down in the performance between his car and Gary Beck's. And Joe Amato tried the whole shot on the Christmas tree, and it did not pay off as Joe Amato lost at the starting line by the red light. As Gary Beck coasts to a stop, he is moving into the finals against Shirley Muldowney to determine the first ever top fuel champion at the North Star Nationals. Gary Beck's car, a engineering masterpiece. Absolutely one of the finest pieces of equipment in competition today. And Carl Olson had a chance to talk with Gary and find out what a top fuel dragster is all about. The top fuel dragster is the fastest and quickest accelerating competition vehicle in the world. And the particular car that we're looking at, driven by Gary Beck, is the quickest car in the history of the sport of drag racing. In October of 1981 at Orange County Raceway in California, this car covered a standing quarter mile in just 5.57 seconds in excess of 250 miles an hour. And Gary, I wonder if we could just take a quick tour through this car from the front end to the back and have you explain a little bit to us about the engineering features that make this car so competitive. All right, Carl, let's go up front and take a look. Up front here is a very important part of the car because certainly it's where all the steering to, to allow us to keep in a very straight line and, and for the maneuverability on the racetrack. The wheels themselves look like a bicycle wheel, but they're, they're a special rim and a special tire that will go 250 miles an hour. There's not much weight on the front of a top fuel car. They're only about 350 pounds. So each wheel is only carrying half of that. The front wing helps the car at the 250 mile an hour speeds stay down and give the tire a chance to steer. Because the, of the wing, as we'll see on the back of the car, the more wing we use in the back, the more angle that we have to use on the front wing to plant the car like a wedge. Gary, the car appears very long from the driver's cockpit forward, and I see a receptacle here for the fuel tank. Is there any other equipment up here in the front of the car other than the body panels? Not really. The fuel tank is, um, takes up the whole front section, and we put it way up in the front for ballast to help keep the car down at the starting line area, the launch of the car. Nitro's very heavy. This particular car has about 11 gallons of fuel in it. We do have a place way out on the nose that we can stick a little bit of lead ballast if some of the starting lines are extremely hot, good and the car's launching hard. Here this weekend, we're using about 12 pounds up there just to help the front end stay down. The first ever North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway is hosting an overflow crowd as our funny car racers get ready to go. Let's take a look at the current standings in the Winston World Championship points chase in Funny Car Eliminator. We have got heading up the list Frank Hawley. He is just a few, few points ahead of this man, Billy Meyer, and that's who's going to be racing in this round of competition. Hawley doing his burnout, and here goes Billy Meyer. Right behind them is Raymond Beadle. He's already out of the racing. Don Prudhomme not attending this event. Al Segrini was the low qualifier. He'll be coming up in the next pair. Then comes Kenny Bernstein, Tom Anderson, Gary Bergen, who's also in competition and could move up drastically in the point standings. Dale Paldi and Tim Gross rounding out the top 10 standings in the Winston World Championship Series of Championship Drag Racing for Funny Car Eliminator. In the near lane, you're gonna see the car, the 7-Eleven Chief Auto Parts Special of Billy Meyer from Waco, Texas. 27 years old, Meyer's wife, Debbie, home right now, expecting a baby just about any moment. And for Billy, it's a tough time to concentrate. It's also a very tough time on his car. He dropped a couple of cylinders on the last pass when he ran a 216 at 6.18 seconds. To give you a comparison, Hawley, well, on a three-year-old motor, ran 243 miles an hour at a 589, so he's got lane choice. And we're going to have to see if Billy Meyer has found the right combination. This Rislone Chi Town hustler, Frank Hawley, has just been performing superbly throughout the entire season. For Billy Meyer, he is consistently over 250 miles an hour with this Pontiac Trans Am bodied funny car. But Billy Meyer has lost the lane choice. Hawley taking the right hand lane. We saw some smoke out of Gary Beck losing traction in that previous round. Wonder if it'll pay off for Frank Hawley to take that lane. In about six seconds, we'll know. 
As the staging procedure is just about completed, Billy Meyer creeps into the beam. And it is Meyer with a shake and losing the traction. And look at Holly with the museum piece motor of 597, 238 miles an hour. For Billy Meyer, a losing effort of 6.08 seconds, and you saw right off the starting line the car going into the vibration, tire shake situation, and then the car losing traction, and that was just enough. He gave it all he had, 247.93 miles an hour, but Frank Hawley taking the win. In the replay, we watch again as they leave the starting line. They're practically side by side. It's a good start for both drivers, nobody particularly late. You see Billy Meyer right there, losing traction, the car vibrating violently. That's the time that Frank Hawley just moved ahead and held that lead. This is the fourth time these two have met in national competition. Frank Hawley's won three of them. And it is Hawley into the finals for the second week in a row at a major event. He just won the popular hot rodding championship one week ago. And now with a fine 597 in the semifinals, Frank Hawley will face the winner of this next race. Will it be the super brute car of Al Segrini, who's racing here in the near lane? Or will it be this man, the Orange Baron of Gary Bergen from Stanton, California? And I'll tell you, Marty, Gary Bergen showed them all how it was done in round number one. Bergen got a 597 with a three. He's got the lane choice over Segrini, and he's going to take that right-hand side. Ran 246 miles an hour, and when I went back into the pits to take a look at the cars, they were back together, ready to go. He had just singed a couple of cylinders, or a couple of pistons, I should say, but nothing major. He is ready for action. When we talk about singeing and burning and what have you, what actually happens is that a cylinder will lean out to the extent that the piston literally melts or it, uh, it distorts itself to the extent that the piston rings don't do the job that they're supposed to do. And that can cause some rather severe damage internally. When you see a lot of smoke out of an engine at the finish line, that generally is what has occurred, that the engine has leaned itself out to the point that it's literally melted the pistons. And I mean, they can burn holes right through them. Looks like a welding torch in them. And of course, in about an hour and 30 minutes, they can have them all apart, back together again, and a brand new engine on the starting line. For Al Segrini, he had a 597 in round number one, and of course, it was to the thousandth of a second to determine who had low ET. You know, the only thing about burned pistons is after you've burned them, about the only thing they're good for is ashtrays. Ashtrays <laughs> are paperweights, that's it. You burn a big enough hole in them, you're going to burn up your desk if you try to use them <laughs> for an ashtray. But for Al Segrini, he's not thinking about burn pistons. He'd certainly sacrifice one of those aluminum lambs if he had to, to get into the finals here at the North Star Nationals. Segrini won the Winter Nationals over Raymond Beadle, and he was runner-up at the Spring Nationals to Frank Hawley. So can Al Segrini make it to the finals or Gary Bergen? It will be whoever gets to the finish line first without a red light, cross the center line, or going out over the outer extremity of the track. That's enough problems. Not Withstanding the fact that you got to beat your competition. Oh, and Gary Bergen just fries the tires. Looks like days of old. And boy, you talk about Segrini. Ladies and gentlemen, a 596 at 237 miles an hour. Tremendous blast by Segrini. And that's got to put him in definitely a favored position over Frank Hawley. And that dispels all theories about a one-lane racetrack. Because right. Al Segrini was in the left-hand lane, and he just ran 596. As we watch again, you'll see what happened to Gary Bergen. He just blistered the tires right off the starting line, smoked him in like the days of old when the tires and the rubber compound were very hard. And that's the way drag racing used to be, just tire smoke from start to finish. But they found out that when the tires are smoking, they are slipping, and you don't move ahead as rapidly as you can. For Segrini, a picture-perfect run at 5.96 seconds gives him lane choice in the finals as he will face up against the Rislow and Chi-Town hustler Frank Hawley doing the driving. In the Big Bud Shootout, we've not talked about that. That is a special event within an event. And it is coming up at the U.S. Nationals over Labor Day weekend. It is the top eight funny cars in the country will be running for a special 
Budweiser sponsored payoff of $25,000 to the winner and $5,000 to the runner up. The point standings as you saw them displayed give you the top eight cars in this Big Bud shootout and Billy Meyer heads up that program and the, the qualifying was based on the qualifying performance of the racer throughout the season. As it goes on throughout the year, culminating here at the North Star Nationals, Billy Meyer will be the number one qualifier in that Big Bud shootout and Dale Paldi rounding out that eight car field. They'll be going off on Sunday at the U.S. Nationals the day before Labor Day as we will see inside the qualifying for Funny Car at the U.S. Nationals that famous Big Bud shootout with $25,000 going to the winner. Before we get back to more action on the racetrack, let's move down to the finish line area where Carl Olson is caught up with one of our finalists in Funny Car. Thank you, Dave. I'm with Al Sagrini, and Al, you're one of the few racers here who has had the opportunity to run both lanes today. You were low qualifier, so you had lane choice in the first round. You switched over and ran the left lane, and uh, it appears that one of the lanes is starting to go away. What do you think you're going to do in the final? Well, it seems to me I've been watching the lanes really close this last session. The first round today, we chose the right lane, which we qualified in. The car ran six, nine, uh, 597 in the right lane. This next pass we just made, we didn't have lane choice, and Bergen put us in the left lane, so we get a chance to try it, and we just ran 596. So we actually we improved in the left lane, and watching both cars run ahead of me, Frank Holly and the Chai Town Hustle had a little trouble in the right lane. He's hazing the tires a little bit. I think the right-hand lane's starting to go away on us out there. Okay, well, that'll be something to watch then in the finals, Dave, and back to you. It sure will, Carl, and he has the lane choice in the finals of Funny Car Eliminator, and we'll be getting to that and other racing in just a moment as we return to the first-ever Quaker State North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway in Brainerd, Minnesota. At the North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway, I'm Dave McClelland, along with Marty Reed and Carl Olson, and we're set to go into Super Gas, one of the new innovations in championship drag racing on the national event circuit for the first time during this 1982 season. This is a potpourri of race cars like you've never seen before. That's right, that is a 55 Chevrolet across track from us. That is Greg Holm from Buell, Minnesota. His car is powered by a 454 cubic inch Chevrolet. Nearest uh, our ESPN position, Dan's Rust from Maple Grove, Minnesota, with his Camaro. And a red light start for Greg Holm puts that 55 Chevy out of competition. An automatic win for Dan's Rust. They run heads up in Super Gas. That means they leave the starting line together under ideal conditions. They cannot run quicker than 10.04. And Marty, that is designed to keep the cost of racing at a level that everybody can afford to do. That's exactly right. So many of the categories have gotten so expensive that NHRA's idea was to bring it down in this category so that anybody who wanted to race could race. Now, normally at sea level, the index is at 990, but we're at 1,300 feet or over it, actually, and that's why the adjustment to 10 oh. You can't run quicker than 10.04, and Bruno Massell in a 78 Chevy with a 460 cubic inch big block is up against the Fat Cat Vet, the 70 rat motor Chevrolet, and a tremendous hole shot for Bob Tangent in the Corvette. As you can see, he extends his lead and then slows down to make sure he stays in without any problem at 10.48 seconds against Bruno Massell's losing 9.98, but a day late off the starting line for Bruno, and a tough break for the Elmhurst, Illinois-based entry. As we watch again, there you can see the Corvette moving already a Bob Tangent, and Bruno Massell, who knows what was going through his mind at the moment, but whatever it was, it didn't pay off. Marty? He was probably looking at his television monitor. You know what they say, <laughs> you snooze, yeah. you lose. Joe Covert is the Cedarburg, Wisconsin entry, driving the 77 Vega in Super Gas. Don Corbier from Reese, Michigan. A 77 Monza in the far lane. Again, this is heads up style competition, though we've not seen a good start yet in the four cars we have watched. Both cars now in and state. There's a good one. 
this kind of racing can be very, very close. And bear in mind, you cannot run quicker than 10.04. At the finish line, it is Corbier. He is too quick. Also, the car in the tower lane, Covert, is too quick, but he runs out by less than does Corbier. So that puts Covert into the next round of competition. One final pair remaining in Super Gas Eliminator. Pat Schwinn against Larry Hotchkiss as we watch again uh, the finish of this last race, and that's how close it can get at the finish line. Joining us here in our broadcast booth, and we're certainly happy to welcome him to ESPN, is the president of the National Hot Rod Association, the man with the biggest smile in the entire state of Minnesota today, and that is Wally Parks. Wally, pleasure what? to have you here. Dave, I'll tell you, I've never attended an event for the first time out that gave me more satisfaction than this one does here. It seems like everything was ready-made and waiting for us. Far beyond our expectations. A good start, Wally, in his last pair of super gassers, as you see Larry Hotchkiss in the 74 Dodge on the tower side against Pat Schwinn's Camaro. Schwinn is the winner with a bit of a hole shot off the starting line, putting Hotchkiss on the trailer thus far at this North Star Nationals. Wally. The folks here, Dick Rowe and his fine staff, Jerry Hansen, the track owner at Brainerd International Raceway, says this is absolutely the largest crowd ever to jam this facility. That must make you rather proud. It makes me feel good. I understand it's also the largest auto race that's ever been produced in the state of Minnesota. And that, that's even better. <laughs> What are your plans? How do you how do you come back from an event like this going into the 1983 season for the North Star Nationals? Well, I think we spent three days here finding things that we could improve on for next year. Uh, ordinarily, it takes us three years to get an event really accepted in any community where you go in for the first time. Probably the only exception we ever had was when we went to Columbus, Ohio, because we were 10 years late getting there. But this one was an instant success, and it, it's overwhelming in what we have found in here in cooperation, attendance, and everything that goes with it. We're just delighted. I would say that you're probably just as happy with the entire 1982 season thus far. It's probably been the best one we've had in at least 10 years. Part of that's because we've had good weather, as we have here this weekend. But everything seems to be up. We're involved in a, in a situation that seems to be a luxury market. And when times and circumstances around the nation are down, ours goes up. And we're just delighted that people come out in these numbers and these quantities to see what's going on and look at all these fine cars. Wally, we're certainly des delighted that you could spend a few moments with us here in our ESPN broadcast booth. Again, congratulations on an outstanding event here at the North Star Nationals. And, of course, everybody looking forward to the big one coming up Labor Day at the U.S. Nationals at Indianapolis Raceway Park. It's going to be a real challenge. We'll be back at Brainerd International Raceway for this inaugural Quaker State North Star Nationals in just a moment. Back at Brainerd International Raceway, it's time for the semifinals of Super Gas here at the inaugural North Star Nationals. And here is the Corvette in the near lane from Rosemont, Minnesota of Bob Pangan. Don't forget, this is the class where you can do just about anything you want. There is very few limitations except for the fact you cannot run quicker than 10.04 seconds. In the Camaro is Dan's Rust, another Minnesota-based car from Maple Grove. His 68 Camaro powered by a 460 cubic inch engine, 480 cubic inches under the hood of the Corvette, and they're off together. The limiting factor here is 10.04 seconds, and at a 10.07, it is Bob Tangent with lots of smoke out of the car. He may have hurt that big block Corvette as the big engine may have given itself some internal pains but it is 10.07 for Bob Tangent the win over Dan's Rust with an identical elapsed time Tangent as you can see going into the light beams takes the win and Tangent out of Rosebot Minnesota is the winner our next pair is Don Corbier in the Chevy Monza And, or correction, Arthur Joe Covert is in the Vega. He defeated Corbier in the preceding round, while Pat Schwint, driving the 69 Chevy Camaro, is the remaining semi-finalist. The winner to go off against the Corvette of Bob Tangent for the first ever Super Gas title here at the first ever North Star Nationals. 
Silver gas, just one of several of uh, the sportsman eliminator categories that have been contested here at Brainerd International Raceway, and we'll be seeing the finalists in some of the other categories in just a few moments. Right now, we're trying to find out who will be the man to race Bob Tangent in the final of Super Gas Eliminator. The Camaro in the far lane is Pat Schwinn. He comes from Fargo, North Dakota. While out of the state of Wisconsin, Arthur Joe Covert. A broad mix of race cars, some old, some new. Making up this super gas field. As we started off with 32 cars. There were some roadsters, some old gas coupe sedans, some Anglias. But as we narrowed it down to the four cars in the finalist, these remaining two here in the semifinals pit a Vega against a Camaro. Again, the limiting factor is that 10.04 second breakout. You cannot run faster. hole shot by Arthur Covert here in the tower lane. The finish line, it is Covert with the win as he defeats Pat Schwint. And it will be Arthur Joe Covert up against Bob Tangent. And it is very close at the final. But Covert eking out the win over the Camaro of Pat Schwint. Just inches separating them at the finish line. Back at the starting line, our good compatriot Marty Reed has had an opportunity to catch up with a gentleman that has been in drag racing for many years. Marty? Name the granddaddy of drag racing, C.J. Hart. He started the first drag strip back in 1950, and you held the first official race. That's correct. At Santa Ana, California. It wasn't abandoned. It was airport alongside of it. What are you doing these days for NHRA, CJ? I'm pulling the jet around, and helping them all I can, anywhere I can. Just tickled to death to be with them. Still staying active in the sport? Oh, I should say so. And this NHRA bunch is something else. I got to say one thing. This Dick uh, Rowe, he reminds me of Mickey Thompson. Mickey was all over the place. Dick, Dick is doing the same thing here and doing a wonderful job. And you certainly got a wonderful place here. CJ, look what you've grown to. This is your sport. Thanks for talking to us. Let's go back upstairs. Thank you very much, Marty. CJ Hart, at the age of 72, ran the first commercial drag strip way back in 1950. He's just as anxious as we are to get to the finals, and we're just a few moments away. Don't you go away, because we'll be right back at the North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway. <laughs> The sport of championship drag racing has an enviable safety record, and that has been evidenced here at the North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway. One of the reasons why is the NHRA Safety Safari, and Carl Olson is at the finish line and has more details. Without question, the most famous and efficient group of emergency crews and vehicles and equipment in all of motorsports is the NHRA Safety Safari. And I'm here with Jim Van Dyke, who is NHRA's equipment director and chief of the Safety Safari, to talk about some of the items that we find on one of the emergency trucks that the NHRA uses. Jim, uh, first of all, we have an extremely specialized looking piece of equipment here. Could you tell us what that is? Yes, this is what they call the Jaws for Life. It's for cutting uh, drivers out of the race cars or roll cages, or we can spread doors open or whatever it might be. We very seldom use it, but it's one of the best tools we have with us. Great. Uh, I noticed there uh, is a fire suit here that looks very similar to what the drivers wear in competition. Yes, it's similar. It's about three layers thicker, so they can go right in a car and get the driver out if they have to. And I suspect that the uh, hood yes, assembly is also in that suit. They can get in the fire for about 10 seconds so they can see right through that helmet there. You have a variety of types of fire extinguishers here, and I suspect you probably encounter electrical fires and fuel fires yes. and whatever. Uh, also, I'm, I'm curious about uh, the big fires, the funny cars uh, at the big end of the racetrack. It doesn't appear that there's enough equipment here to handle that kind of thing. No, we have another truck. This is considered number one. An emergency two truck is not here right now, but it has 150 gallon water that's charged with nitrogen. It's just like a pressurized coming out of a fire hydrant. And we use light water and it puts the fire out real quick for the funny car drivers and also gas fires. Thanks very much, Jim, and I know all of the drivers in competition here today appreciate your efforts and the efforts of your fine crew. Thank you. Carl, we thank you for bringing us up to date on the safety equipment being used by the NHRA Safety Safari. 
We've seen it in use once today. We hope we don't have to watch it again as we get set to go with the finals in several categories here at the North Star Nationals. Don't you go away because Pro Stock and Funny Car coming your way in just a moment. In the finals at the North Star Nationals, we move into competition eliminator. This is one of the sportsman categories that has been in competition throughout the entire day here, and we're into the finals. Paul McCure, driving the Checkmate Camaro from Berkeley, Michigan, is in the near lane. In the far lane is Danny Townsend out of Muncie, Indiana, driving his altered car. It's an Austin Bantam Roadster with a big block Chevrolet. The head start in this style of racing, the handicap will be going to Paul McCure. He will leave the starting line two and a quarter seconds, actually 2.28 seconds ahead of Danny Townsend at the finish line. It'll be Townsend in the altar charging hard to try to catch Paul McCure. The countdown will go. The head start going to McCure. at the finish line it's going to be close Townsend closing quick closing fast did he catch him the win light say Danny Townsend wins it by just a few inches 7.62 seconds his speed over 178 miles an hour an outstanding 994 for Paul McCure at 134 as we watch again our ESPN slow motion stop action will bring you right down to the finish line as you can see some 40 miles an hour faster comes Danny Townsend and he just passes Paul McCure at the finish line a great race and our congratulations to Danny Townsend the champion in competition eliminator at the North Star National we're ready now for the finals in super gas eliminator we started our coverage with eight cars we're down to the final pair it is the 77 Vega of Arthur Joe Covert from Cedarburg Wisconsin a 430 cubic inch big block Chevrolet resting under the hood of the Vega, the Fat Cat Corvette. We saw some smoke come out of the engine of Bob Tangent's Corvette in the semifinal round. Don't know whether it means any engine damage, but this is the finals in Super Gas Eliminator. Again, a breakout is in effect of 10.04 seconds. You cannot run quicker than that. That is the limiting factor in Super Gas Racing allowing a broad mix of cars, different types and sizes of engines, and the drivers can just about, and owners and builders can do just about whatever they want. Bob Tangent and Arthur Joe Covert. A good start for both cars. Covert with the advantage off the starting line. Here comes Tangent. And at the finish line, the win going to Bob Tangent, who is the super gas winner at this NHRA North Star Nationals. We'd like to also congratulate two other sportsman winners here in Stock Eliminator, Marlon Bogner from Omaha, Nebraska, winning the North Star Nationals title. And in Super Stock, Rick Johnson out of Hutchison, Minnesota, the winner with his Hemi Plymouth in Super Stock Eliminator. Our congratulations to them. At the North Star Nationals at Brainerd International Raceway, a record crowd is in attendance here, including some 8,000 campers that have spent the weekend in the north woods of central Minnesota. They've had a great time. We hope you have enjoyed all the excitement of this championship drag racing event, the inaugural North Star Nationals. This is the finals of Top Alcohol Dragster. From Minneapolis, Minnesota, the car nearest our ESPN camera position is Vic Anderson. His car powered by a Rodec engine, which is an aluminum, aluminum racing engine that is basically a replica of a Chevrolet. Vic from Minneapolis has got to be the hometown favorite, don't you say, Marty? Well, he's got the hometown fans behind him, but he's got to come up with about three more tenths of power because he ran a 692 last time. Daryl Gwynn with a 664 his competition and that means a, a big big edge to Daryl Gwynn. A big big margin for Gwynn at 20 years of age he is one of the rising superstars in this sport of championship drag racing. He is not uh, he is currently number two in the points chase and could possibly pick up a number of points on Don Woosley the current points leader in fact he was only was less than 40 points behind going into this event for the Winston World Champion title and Daryl Gwynn at this point has certainly passed Don Woosley for the points lead 
which will culminate, of course, in the end of the season with a nice cash award going to the top alcohol dragster champion. Daryl Gwynn needs to win right here to move into the finals of Pro Comp Eliminator at the North Star National. Vic Anderson, near lane, Daryl Gwynn in the far lane. The power advantage continuing for Daryl Gwynn. 6.66 seconds his time. His speed, 207 miles an hour. A valiant effort by the Minneapolis, Minnesota-based car of Vic Anderson, but to no avail at 6.90 seconds, a speed of 191. So Daryl Gwynn with his dad driving the crew truck in hot pursuit. We'll move into the finals of Pro Comp Eliminator. As we watch again, you see Daryl Gwynn just outpowering Vic Anderson from the start. He had a bit of a hole shot. The car in the far lane leaving just a few hundredths of a second before Vic Anderson. But the horsepower advantage of Daryl Gwynn coming into play as they near the finish line, and he extends his lead to move into the Pro Comp final. Well, he's getting such top end power, too. He ran a 207, a 203, and again a 207 here. For alcohol cars, outstanding performance at the elevation of 1,300 plus feet here at Brainerd International Raceway. And the nitro burning cars using the nitromethane fuel, which is, as we said earlier, an oxygen bearing type of fuel, allows them to dial in just more horsepower by putting in more nitro in the tank. But for the alcohol cars, they've got to finesse it. Here we come down to the finals of Top Alcohol Funny Car in a matchup. I'll tell you, this is one written in the books. This is between number one and number two in the point standings in Alcohol Funny Car, Ace Manzo. Now, Frank got here with a 665-208 victory over Vern Most. Now, Bob Gutchalk ran a 670 at 205, beating Don Haywood in the semifinals. Manzo came into the event leading Bob Gutchalk by 356 points. So, right now, a big uh, chance for Bob Gottschalk to pick up some of that margin. He cannot go into the lead since they're meeting here in the finals, but he sure could pick up some of that right here against Ace Manzo. Manzo, of course, the reigning Winston World Champion. He'd love to repeat. Gottschalk gets the word from his crew. Let's start it up. And he will go through the starting procedures, as does Ace Manzo. It's a very tense time for these drivers, going through their mind exactly what they want to do, whether they want to bring it off the line a little harder this time, or in some cases with the, the smoking of the tires, ease up a little bit, wait till it locks up, then nail it. With their three-speed planetary transmissions, these cars launch very, very hard. They've got a tremendous first gear ratio, and they will come off the starting line almost as quick as their nitro-burning counterparts. The difference is, is in the middle and the top end the horsepower available to the nitro funny car. But Ace Manzo has mastered this. This alcohol competition very well as he won the world championship a year ago. Bob Gottschalk in hot pursuit of him this year. 300 some odd points behind coming in. They come down to the finals of Top Alcohol Funny Car. The winner of this will go into the Pro Comp Finals against Daryl Gwynn. And we should point out Frank Manzo, as we said a little earlier, set a new alcohol funny car record last week at the uh, popular hot rodding championships with a 655 and he's been very consistent here he qualified with a 660 then ran a 661 in first round and a 665 in the semifinals as carl olson uh, has been pointing out that the racetrack is just about the same on both sides and ace manzo taking that right hand lane giving the left lane to Bob Gottschalk. I don't know that there is any difference. We've watched as the competition has proceeded in the top fuel dragster, the top alcohol funny car, and the top alcohol dragster, and it doesn't really seem to make much difference. I was talking to Shirley Muldowney's crew, and they uh, aren't worried about lane choice right now going into uh, the finals. Well, what a matchup that'll be, and we'll be getting to that here in just a moment on ESPN's coverage of this North Star Nationals. In top fuel eliminator, Gary Beck will go off against Shirley Muldowney. This race is between Frank Manzo in the far lane, Bob Gottschalk here in the near lane. The winner to go against Daryl Gwynn for the overall Pro Comp Championship. Both cars building some heat in the engines and listen to the RPMs come up at the starting line. Creeping forward into that final light beam, which indicates they are properly staged. Got shock and Manzo. You're 
You couldn't ask for a closer start. What's it like at the finish line? Frank Manzo by a half a car length. 6.60, matching his qualifying time to a losing but tremendous effort by Bob Gottschalk of a 6.67 at 205. So Ace Manzo picks up the valuable points and moves into the Pro Comp Finals here at the North Star Nationals. In the replay, you can see there is very little difference between the two cars as they leave the starting line. As they pass our camera position just a few hundred feet out, they were neck and neck. Then as they approach the starting line, the top end horsepower of Frank Manzo pays off. Less than a car length separating Bob Gottschalk and Frank Manzo. So it is Manzo at 6.60 seconds. He will have lane choice over Daryl Gwynn as we will be moving into the finals of Pro Comp Eliminator along with the finals of Top Fuel Eliminator in just a few moments. Right now, let's go down to one of those Pro Comp finalists, Daryl Gwynn, who's with Carl Olson. Thanks, Dave. And Daryl, you've been racing alcohol dragsters all day long. Suddenly, you're faced with racing an alcohol funny car in the final, and a very quick one at that. Ace Manzo running a 6.60 and actually getting lane choice. What are you going to do to race him? Well, we're going to play it by ear. Uh, the dragsters will run 6.60 all day long. The funny cars usually slack off in the final a little bit. The track conditions get worse towards the end, and the funny cars usually don't stay as consistent as Frank is. He's doing a real good job. The track's really good. Uh, we're just going to give it our best shot. Okay, thank you, and back to you, Dave. Thank you, Carl. That sets up our final for Pro Comp Eliminator. Ace Manzo against Daryl Gwynn, and of course, the finals in Top Fuel. Gary Beck against Shirley Muldowney as we come right back to Brainerd International Raceway for the finals at the North Star National. way at the North Star Nationals we're into the finals of Pro Comp Eliminator. We have watched an eight car top alcohol dragster field, an eight car top alcohol funny car field narrow themselves down to one dragster and one funny car. The best in both categories meeting for the overall Pro Comp Championship. The dragster backing up is Daryl Gwynn from Miami, Florida. 20 years old, now a professional racer. He started when he was a high school student. Alongside of him is the funny car of Ace Manzo. Frank Manzo won the Winston World Championship title a year ago. He has got a leg up on it after defeating Bob Gottschalk in the finals of Top Alcohol Funny Car. He will be going against Daryl Gwynn for the overall Pro Comp Championship. And the thing to remember is Ace Manzo has been running about five one hundredths of a second quicker consistently through this race than Daryl Gwynn. And that may not sound like a lot, but it's enough for victory. Right. It's he who gets to the finish line first. Will it be Daryl Gwynn with the dragster? Generally, the dragster is a bit more consistent than the funny cars. Ace Manzo, though, has proved consistency is his forte as he worked his way into the finals with an outstanding 6.60 seconds. All that goes out the window as we're just a few seconds away from knowing who will be the Pro Comp champion. Defeating a quicker Frank Manzo, 6.66 seconds at 205 miles an hour. Manzo a little bit quicker, but late out of the gate, 6.63 at 208 miles an hour. And for Daryl Gwynn, the reflexes of the 20-year-old pay off. Here at the finish line by a car length, your champion in Pro Comp Eliminator, Daryl Gwynn. The finals in Pro Stock Eliminator at the North Star Nationals pit a pair of Chevrolets. The two best in the world at the moment. In the near lane, it will be the red and white car, the man that has already locked up his second consecutive Winston World Championship title. That is Lee Shepard. Frank Iaconio in the red, yellow, and white entry from Totowa, New Jersey, is right alongside of him in the lane furthest from our camera position. Marty, this is uh, anybody's race. If you had to take a guess, I'd say Lee Shepard, but that's purely conjecture at this well, moment. Well, track uh, consistency over the past six race times that these guys have met, Lee Shepard has beat Frank Iaconio five times. Lee Shepard, one of the winningest drivers in all of championship drag racing. Thus far, he has won five national events during the 1982 season. 
one national event going to Frank Iaconio. Shepard has all but locked up completely the Winston World Championship title for the second year in a row. Frank Iaconio, the racer closest to him, currently number two in the point standing. All they're thinking about now, though, is this North Star Nationals title. As the 500 give against Chevrolet Camaros, a pair on the starting line and a great start for both drivers. It's anybody's race in the middle of the car. At the finish line, it is Lee Shepard, a 796, 172 miles an hour, a losing 797 for Frank Iaconio, his speed 173. At the finish line, it was less than a half a car length separating the two. As we watch again, they approach the timing beams across the finish line, and at the end of the quarter mile, you see, just pulling ahead is Lee Shepard, your winner in pro stock at the North Star Nationals. The final in funny car eliminator is Al Segrini. Sits behind the wheel, the body yet to be lowered on his Super Brute Special. Segrini from southeastern Massachusetts is against Frank Hawley, the current points leader in the Winston World Championship points chase. Segrini by one one hundredth of a second, a 596 to a 597. Has the performance advantage going into this final round. He has the lane choice over the Chi Town Hustler. And Frank Hawley is not to be counted out, is he? Well, these two met once before at the Spring Nationals in the finals, and it was Frank Hawley coming away with the victory there. I tell you, we have seen a lot of tire smoke and a loss of traction by Gary Beck in the top fuel final just a few moments ago. And what it means is could the Chi Town Hustler have the problems of tire shake and losing traction? We'll have to find that out as he is sitting and thinking about how to leave that starting line because just a few extra hundred RPM could make the difference. For Al Segrini, he didn't think lane choice made a whole lot. We saw in the semifinals when he ran that 596, it was in the supposed bad lane. He told me in the pits that his car has been launching very well all day long. He says it's been so consistent off the line, and he feels that's been one of the big keys to the reason he's in the final. For Segrini, it will be his opportunity for a second win this season. He won the Winter Nationals title, was runner-up, as Marty just told you, at the Spring Nationals. For Frank Hawley, he won the Gator Nationals and the Spring Nationals and the popular Hot Rodding Championship. He was runner-up at the Southern Nationals. And Hawley is currently the leader in points for the Winston World Championship title. The team of Barconas, Coyle, and Minnick out of Chicago, Illinois, Frank Hawley, a Canadian, the driver of the Rislow Chi Town Hustler, against Al Segrini in the Super Brute Special. And it is Al Segrini up in smoke, but he's still trying to pull it out. He does not. It is Frank Hawley. 599 as the Chi Town Hustler booms to a finish of 247 miles an hour. 6.08 seconds, the losing time as Segrini just a little bit too much power and clutch. From the starting line, we watch again as Segrini losing traction just off the starting line. There it is, up in smoke is what they call it, and that cost him the race. Look at Hawley glued to the ground. It's really something, the way Hawley's car come, came off the line. We were talking about the fact that he may have the traction problems, and the reverse is what happened. Look at that. Well, but it was close at the finish. Al Segrini gave it everything he could. A fantastic finish to Funny Car Eliminator. 599 at 247 miles an hour. Frank Hawley, your North Star Nationals Funny Car Champion. A tremendous finish to Funny Car Eliminator as the Chi Town Hustler of Farconas, Coil, and Minnick wins it all. Frank Hawley, the driver, he's with Carl Olson. Thanks, Dave. Frank, from this vantage point, that was just a tremendous race with lots going on. Tire smoke, and it looked to us from here like you had to come from behind. Yeah, we sure did. We left the start line, and I thought uh, to spin the tires a little bit. I didn't see Al at that point. And uh, we pedaled the car a little, got it back on course. And then I saw the green car, and I chased him probably for, you know, till three-quarter track. And then uh, Austin's got the motor running awful fast today, and it just, 
he disappeared and we drove for a little while without seeing him and as you know once you do that you're probably in front and uh, you know I've run I guess almost 247 and uh, that's the only thing that saved us yeah it certainly was uh, it seems to me that this is the year of the Chi Town Hustler from a point standpoint I know when we talked earlier in the year you were going to take it one race at a time now it just seems like there's hardly any way to avoid going for the world championship you're right. I mean, we've got some people that we've picked up along the way. They're helping us a lot. Right now, I haven't tallied the points. Uh, we're going to count this race. We're probably, you know, going to have a 1,000-point lead going into the U.S. Nationals. We can count two more races, and there's only three more left. And uh, we're committed now. This is it. The last race of the day in Top Fuel Eliminator. Shirley Muldowney, two-time Winston World. She has already won two national events to the Gator Nationals and the Spring Nationals. She is aiming for a record third world champion title in Top Fuel Eliminator. The first woman ever licensed to drive a Top Fuel dragster, probably considered by many today the premier Top Fuel racer in the sport. Marty, you've been back in the pit area. How is Shirley's car? Well, she smoked a few pistons in her semifinal victory over Mark Oswald. She ran a 571 at 249 miles an hour, but no real hard damage to the car. They're not really concerned about lane choice. They feel their machine can beat any machine out here today. She's confident. She's also getting herself strapped in, and as you can see, the safety belts being pulled tight as the crewman on her competition's car is turning the motor over backwards to make sure there is no fluid in the cylinders to have a hydraulic condition as Gary Beck sits patiently waiting as Shirley puts on the bright pink helmet in her Pioneer Special. Now, Gary was telling me in the pits that he might try and take out a little power in the low end. In other words, off the starting line, he's worried about hazing the tires. In other words, breaking traction. So we'll have to see if his uh, strategy pays off. Gary Beck driving the quickest car in all of drag racing today. He set that at the Winston World Finals last year at 5.57 seconds. He was the low qualifier at a 5.65, matched a 5.65, did Shirley Muldowney. Gary is a two-time national champion, a former world champion. He knows what the winner circles like. He's looking over at Shirley saying, come on, let's get this show on the road. The tension is got, you could cut it. I, you can feel it when you're down on the starting line. The crews, you, when they, they move around the machine, their hands are quivering. They're not the ones driving, but they have worked so many hours, so many days here to get to this moment, and everything is on the line. Gary casting an eye at our ESPN camera. As the crews complete their preparations, and as soon as the race master gives them the word, they'll be starting the 2,500 horsepower plus engines and moving into the water to get set for the top fuel finals. When we talk about horsepower on a top fuel dragster or a funny car, it's almost impossible to measure. There's no dyno build today that can withstand the onslaught of power from one of these aluminum racing engines developed specifically for drag racing. Coming to life, Shirley Muldowney's engine. Her crew chief, Ron Tobler, her son, John Muldowney, on the crew, taking the starter away as the Pioneer Special moves up into the water box. Shirley took the measure of the fastest car in the sport in the preceding round as she defeated Mark Oswald in the Candies and Hughes car. She's now matched up against the quickest car at this event and also the quickest car in the sport, that of Larry Miner, the car driven by Gary Beck. We'll see if uh, taking a little horsepower out helps Gary Beck. He hazed the tire very, very severely in the semifinal round. And when those tires are smoking, that means they aren't pulling ahead or the car's not moving ahead as it should. So we'll see if Gary's strategy pays off and maybe Shirley, as confident as she is, can pull off a victory here in Top Fuel Eliminator. One of the quickest fields of all time in this first ever North Star Nationals comes down to this in Top Fuel Eliminator. The final two cars, Shirley Muldowney against Gary Beck.
what we're seeing here, if you notice how long it's taking to get this uh, race going, it's not because uh, <laughs> of anything else except strategy. These two are playing a little mental game with each other right now to see who's going to stage first, who's going to get into those lights. Because if they can get one in the lights there, sitting there for a little bit too long, then your hand gets a little sweaty. And you just may red light. Also, these engines are very susceptible to heat buildup. And when too much heat gets in them, they really make too much horsepower. And then when you can smoke the tires just right down to the cords. But right now, nobody's thinking about smoking the tires except these two drivers. That's Gary Beck in the far lane, Shirley Muldowney, the finals in Top Fuel Eliminator. Seven at 251 miles an hour. Shirley Muldowney saved it all as she defeats Gary Beck in Top Fuel Eliminator. As we look again, you can see on our ESPN replay how this race was decided. A bit of a hole shot for Shirley Muldowney. She moved just a hair quick. You see the tires of Gary Beck already up in smoke as they cross the starting line. At that point, Shirley Muldowney, unless something went wrong, had the race won. And I'll tell you, nothing went wrong as Shirley records a 5.67 seconds at 251 miles an hour plus and a roaring cheer for the top fuel champion, Shirley Muldowney. The record book is being rewritten by this woman, Shirley Muldowney, as she powered her car to a big victory here at the North Star Nationals. Carl Olson, how does she feel? Well, obviously, Dave, we're here with a very happy Shirley Muldowney and her crew. And uh, Shirley, you know, this was almost a picture-perfect race. I mean, number one race, number two in the final, but in this case, number two won the race. How did it feel? It felt good about 200 feet before the lights. I didn't hear him, I didn't see him, so I thought we had it won. Well, uh, the World Championship Series is certainly shaping up to look favorable for your effort again this year. It's a battle for everybody that Mark Oswald he is going to be very tough to get by. I hope I do, because if I do, I'll know, <laughs> I'll know that I did something this year. Well, certainly, Dave, the most exciting top field championship points chase in years. And that's a wrap from here at the big end of Brainerd International Raceway. And back to you. Shirley Muldowney, your top fuel champion. Our congratulations to her. Our thanks going to the entire staff here at Brainerd International Raceway and, of course, the staff from NHRA for making our job so much easier. A particular thank you going to Fran Armstrong and her crew of spotters for keeping us up to date on all the action at the North Star Nationals. We hope you've enjoyed the racing because this has been one tremendous drag race. For Marty Reed, for Carl Olson, I'm Dave McClellan saying so long from Brainerd International Raceway.